right, good morning. Welcome, everyone. Um, I'm, I am John Zimkis today. Wait a minute, let me go down to my John voice. Hello, welcome. No, I can't do that. My name is Lisa Holtz. I'm one of the assistant directors here. And I am stepping in for John today to give you the calendar of upcoming events, which hopefully most of you are aware of if you've checked the website, but just in case. Um, as Watkins Catering is serving our delicious lunch, which I hope you all enjoy, um, I will give you a rundown of some upcoming events. So, um, on May 26th, that's a Friday, we have a cemetery tour that will be um, held at the Pioneer Cemetery. Now, that's the oldest cemetery here in Springboro. It's the smaller of the cemetery. Uh, Lebanon, oh my goodness. I used to live in Springboro, so excuse me, it's in Lebanon. Um, so it's a smaller of the two cemeteries. It's a much uh, shorter tour. So I know some people, um, the other one can last three hours or more. So this is a much friendlier tour. So if you're interested in that, um, you do need to pre-register and you can do that on the website. That starts at 630. <clears throat> also, we're going to have the Beetle Cabin open um, on the first Saturday of each month for the next few months. Um, this is a free event, family friendly. It'll be open from 11 to 1. Um, last or last Saturday, or the couple Saturdays ago, sorry, the Saturday in May, um, we had a weaving demonstration by Sarah Stegemuller. This uh, coming up. On, um, in June will be folk tales and ghost stories by Michael and John. So bring the families and they will um, entertain you with stories. Coming up uh, also the first weekend in June is our flea market. Um, that will be Friday the 2nd and Saturday the 3rd. That's from 10 to 4. Now, we are looking for donations. If you have some items around your house that you are thinking about passing on to someone else, we will um, gladly accept most any items. Um, so just feel free to bring them to us, and we'll be happy to um, put those in the flea market. Um, our next music at the museum, and this is the last one of the series for this year, will be June 8th at 7 p.m. Um, you please purchase tickets ahead of time so we know a good count. You are able to purchase at the door. So if you have some friends that want to come along last minute, they are more than welcome. Our entertainment will be squeeze play. It will be an accordion band, not just one accordion. You know, that's pretty fun. A couple accordions are fun, but a whole band of accordions. It's, it's going to be a rolling night. I think that, that'll be great. So that'll be held right here. Tickets are $15, uh, $10, and $5, and all the information is on the website. Um, right currently, we have an art exhibit up in the gallery. That's Susan Mahan. Um, beautiful multimedia floral works. If you haven't had a chance to see that, please, after lunch and the lecture, join us up in the gallery, um, not to be missed. Reminder, your ticket to Lunch and Learn does include a tour of the museum. So if you haven't been through in a while, please join us, wander through. Our next art opening will be Friday, June 9th. That's when the Welshes who own a uh, an art gallery in Bellbrook, Ohio. They will be bringing a selection of native, um, sorry, native photos, right? Nature, nature photos, sorry. We've got a couple, couple later is gonna be Native American art. So nature photos. Um, our next Lunch and Learn, June 21st, is all about coronations. So that will highlight what the symbols are, what the procedures are, going all the way back from the first coronation all the way up to the modern one, which we all just enjoyed. So again, that's, uh, tickets are on sale. Please purchase ahead so that we have a proper count for our caterers. 
Um, last but not least, we are taking reservations for History Camp. History Camp is July 10th or the 13th, and I'm sorry, but this is for children. Um, we are thinking of possibly doing some History Days for adults at some point. We've had some interest in that. That would be kind of fun. But if you know any uh, rising fourth graders through eighth graders, uh, who might be interested, that's a four-day event. It's a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They're here from 9 to 1. Nine, whichever. Yeah, so that does include at least one, if not two, field trips out. So the theme this year is Her Story Camp. So it's all about important women from Warren County and what their contributions to history were. Um, and again, just a special thank you to Watkins Catering, who's done a fabulous job once again with our lunch. Any questions about those events, please refer to the website and hope to see you at all the upcoming events. Thank you. Hand out our lovely dessert. Thank you, Watkins, for a lovely lunch. And I would like to introduce our next speaker, who's going to tell you all about what's new at the museum. Somebody asked me, is there always something, there, always something new? I said, absolutely. Every week, sometimes every day, something comes in and we're so surprised. And, and lately, there's been a lot of boxes coming in and, uh, We've been folk art today again by Mr. Niehoff. Uh, so much has been coming in that it's so interesting. Uh, so I'd like to introduce to you our executive director, Michael Coyen. Well, Jeannie couldn't be possibly more accurate. Not only is the museum gifted with things that are arriving, either by generous patrons who are giving us items, but also by things that we're rediscovering because we didn't know we had them, which is, you know, a bit of a surprise. When you open a drawer or you pull out a file and you begin to thumb your way through it and somehow someone donated an item 40 or 50 or 60 years ago and it missed getting cataloged. And there we have it. It's an incredible array. So today, what I brought you is a cross-section of documentation uh, of works that we have been gifted over the last year, or works that we have, quote unquote, rediscovered that have been in the collection. What you're seeing here is a navigational book that we found in a vault drawer downstairs it is by Thomas Evans, and you see he loved to write his name quite a bit. But my friends, it dates from 1750. And it is a charge by the British Admiralty to Thomas Evans to do navigational charts off the coast of the colonies in New England. We didn't even know we had it. It's a beautiful manuscript. It's incredibly fragile. I'll show you the interior to show you how he can tack sails and what they're doing and depths and so forth and so on. And this manual is all of four to five inches thick on handmade paper, beautifully bound, all hand stitched. It's an amazing find for us to have something like this. So. I pulled it out of the flat file in the vault, and I said to John, what's this? He said, I have absolutely no idea. I've been here all this time and have never seen it. So it's one of those remarkable discoveries. Whence it came from, we have no idea. But we welcome it to our collection, and now it's going to be properly assessed and entered into the archive. Uh, and so, again, one of those wonderful surprises. This seems simple enough. It was given to us by a descendant of Ichabod Corwin and Francis Dunleavy. It's a desk set. 
Obviously, pens in the ink holders, the tops, they're gone. And it came in, and we weren't paying that much attention to it. We just thought, well, we don't have one of these. This is kind of nice. So we'll put it in the law office. And as I picked it up, I had taken the glass ink wells out, flipped it over, and there's a plate on the bottom. This is part of a desk that was used by George Washington while mustering the troops in Morristown, New Jersey. Yes, and it is certified. And we inherited that just this last summer. Absolutely incredible. So these are the kind of things at night when I get a call from security or I hear fire engines go out <laughs> that make my hair stand on end knowing what is in this building and how important it is not just to Lebanon and Warren County history, but to the history of Southwest Ohio, of the Northwest Territories, and importantly of the United States. We have a patchwork quilt of incredible objects. Another find we didn't know until we decided we were going to clean out the doctor's office. And as we were cleaning out and we removed so many things, we found a desk hidden amongst all that stuff. And when we pulled the drawer out, a greater surprise, because we know over in Glendower Mansion, we have a magnificent desk that was Senator Thomas Corwin's when he was in Washington. It's a magnificent desk. But what we didn't know is that we also have his desk from the Ohio State Capitol from 1840 to 42, when Thomas Corwin was governor of Ohio. So, wow, it was moved immediately from that rather obscure place downstairs, upstairs to the Victorian Gallery, where we polished it up and have given it a bit of prominence now. A wonderful find. Again, something we sort of stumbled onto as we go through things and resort. These two vases came in again this last summer, again from the gentleman who was descended from Francis Dunleavy and Ichabod Corwin. And people say, well, you know, should you keep things that, that people collect? Well, <laughs> you can't get much more Lebanon or Warren County than those two names. So they are descendants. These are two vases. They are sterling silver. They're English sterling silver from the age of King Edward VII. And they're magnificent. And they're now on the mantle. This is a rather truncated image here. But they're on the mantle in the Victorian gallery for you to enjoy. And I think we had maybe five crates of sterling silver from prior to 1912, English sterling silver that's now been added to the collection. Um, so if anybody is bored and wants to polish, let us know, okay? <laughs> a table that turned up again with the Corwins this table was made by a descendant of Thomas Corwin and was brought to us from Illinois just this last month. Uh, the uh, top, of course, has been replaced. But what is interesting is that the little dog that was carved, and that was typical of a lot of tables of this era, but that dog actually, um, she said they had a photo they were trying to locate. I think it was a daguerreotype, actually of that dog, that was their pet. So it was made familiar. It wasn't just a standard animal that's been put into that placement, but a wonderful hand carved table. And of course we put it in front of Governor Corwin's mantle in the study upstairs. Well, I can't tell you how grateful we are to KB Richard Niehoff. Mr. Niehoff is sitting right here because as we made an acquaintance some years, well, some months ago, over uh, people we had worked with before, a fellow by the name of George Henkel and a fellow by the name of Ralph Stolle, people that we'd known. And um, Mr. Niehoff wandered through the building, and golly, he liked our building, and he liked our collection. And he especially liked the efforts that Sylvia Outland had made at putting together the Outland Folk Art Gallery. And Nick said, wow, this is really cool. 
I've got some incredible work from museums that I have in museums all over the United States, and I would like to give it a new home. And that new home is here at the Harmon Museum, which is a phenomenal present. Yes, thank you, Nick. So when Jeannie made reference to the boxes, I asked Nick if he had interest in a box company or someone who made bubble wrap, <laughs> because those things were securely packed. And what you're seeing is one wall, and on this wall are some really amazing works. In the top left-hand corner is a sleigh ride with a, a yellow house, and it's by a lady by the name of Emily Lund. She was Scandinavian, and she wound up in the Dakotas. And so her folk art work is largely of life in the Dakotas, in the rough winters and the hot summers and so forth and so on. An incredible piece. Now, one of the things that one must remember about folk art, if you're not used to it, it's an immediate experience. It's created by people who are not encumbered by the shackles of academia. In other words, they are not told these are the proper proportions, these are the proper ways of, to use this material. These are people who largely are self-taught, who are used to using the materials that they choose to express themselves in. So what lies under the folk art is a story. It's an incredible story. I've told my students for years, that's the heart of folk art. It's the story of the artist and the story of the immediacy of the work itself. Below is a work by Mary Shelley. Mary is really quite nice. She's in Ithaca, New York. She's 73. And uh, she prides herself on creating what she calls the art of every day. And so she gives us this beautiful carved barber shop. So, Beautifully, and Mary called the other day and she said she would very much like to do a show here at the Harmon Museum, her first west of the Alleghenies. So I'm hoping we will be working on that. The wonderful portrait in the center, again, with the exception of uh, the dolls and the Marcus Moat twins, these works, of course, were the gift of Mr. Niehoff. The large painting of the lady and two children is by Susanna Payne. She was a New England portrait artist and one of the earliest. She worked largely in Massachusetts and Rhode Island. She was born in 1792. So these paintings are incredibly early. And we now have another, a single portrait by Susanna Payne, which makes us the only museum in the United States that has two works by one of the earliest identified female portrait artists in the United States. That's pretty significant. Well, everybody has to have a pig that looks like that. Imagine, this was one of the first pieces that Mr. Niehoff sent me, and I uncrated it with the staff, and we were going, oh my. <laughs> well, this was created by Leroy Archuleta. He was born in Tosca, New Mexico, and he's the founding father of what they call the wood carving tradition of New Mexico and even into Arizona. He said in his autobiography that he was commanded from God to carve the creatures of the earth. So he doesn't do human beings. He does animals. And he tries to catch their character in their whim. Although I certainly wouldn't want to meet that uh, in any pig pen soon. Below, and we see him over on the table, is the red fox. And the red fox is created and carved by Minnie Adkins. She lives in Isonville, Kentucky. And hopefully, in 2025, we're going to have Minnie to come up here and visit with us as we're laying the groundwork for a major folk art exhibition in 2025 that will go on for about three months. Uh, her foxes, her animals are incredibly uh, well accepted. They are in the American Folk Art Collection 
and a whole host of other museums, the Fenimore up in Cooperstown. So we're very proud to have these examples of art in our collection. I like this one. This is James Harold Jennings, and of course he puts his name on it. The Standing Lady is a separate piece. But James Harold Jennings was born in Pineville, North Carolina. And when asked how he was motivated to create, he says, well, I don't know, I just like to paint wood. But this is an amazing thing, because if you turn this knob... Her arms do this. <laughs> so, so it's a fun piece where he's using material that he was used to using in his life as a tobacco farmer. So it was pretty amazing when you pull all of these things together. A lovely work that graces our lobby because it's new. It's not in the contemporary collection, but... I couldn't just let it get put into the general collection without you looking at it because of the detail. This is Mrs. Monroe, and uh, she has been creating work for 45 years. The title of this is Around the Cake. So it's pretty amazing, and the detail is unbelievable. And I can't tell you the number of cats that I've counted, Nancy Lewis. There are lots of cats in this painting. Her work is in exclusively in the Museum of American Folk Art in New York City and in the Smithsonian and in the Harmon Museum in Lebanon, Ohio. That's pretty significant. Not to be outdone, of course, we have more traditional art. This is a piece that was gifted this last year. It's from the second century AD. It's Roman and it's marble. And it's in my office, looking over my shoulder every day. But it's a marvelous collection. Uh, we add that to our ever-growing sculpture collection. We recently had a bust given to us by Pat South that had graced the State House. And it's now up on the mezzanine, a bust of Benjamin Harrison. He looks a little better than the Cupid, so... Wow, talk about dazzlers for eyes. The tall two vases are Sevres porcelain, and they are around 1835. They're about that tall. The pair is just exquisite. They show the right amount of wear. They're marked well on the bottom. And then the beautiful clock in the center is a Sevres clock from around 1880. But it's all beautiful porcelain, and believe it or not, the clock still runs. Yeah, it's phenomenal. So what we've been doing, what Sylvia Outland as the art curator and I, and Jeannie and Lisa and the staff, we always look for the strengths and weaknesses in our collections because we want to try to keep all of this balanced. If we're short on etchings and engravings, well, let's see if we can ask the public or maybe acquire or find some of those things. If we're looking for no new items from Hopewell, Adena, or Fort Ancient, where can we find those things? Because we want to keep adding to the collection. One of the things about a museum is that it's not static. It constantly has its own energy. It might be a little slower than the racing world around it, but we're dealing for more of a permanence. And we're looking for, I say, a balance when we look at the museum as a whole. This last summer, some of you may know him, Sam Martz, who's a graduate of Lebanon High School and is a prominent architect in Chicago, called and he said, gee, Michael, you know, my great aunt was one of the premier decorators at Rookwood Pottery from its beginning until the 1930s. He said, I want to leave you my entire collection. I'm going to give you this summer, I'm going to bring down the quote unquote production pieces. We should be so lucky. So this is the first cachet of material that he brought down. The rest are the high-end, beautifully fired Rookwood glazes that we're all used to thinking of when we say Rookwood. But the amazing thing is, all of those are signed 
by the artists that worked for Rookwood Pottery. So there probably will be 18 to 20 additional pieces. And he said, either I will get tired of enjoying them or I will be gone and then you'll get them. So, <laughs> but they're coming home. He wanted them to come here. And do you know, prior to this collection, with the exception of a couple of things that the museum bought and Sylvia donated, we had one piece of Rookwood pottery, one, and that was all, which was phenomenal to me when we're in the center of Ohio where art pottery was so prevalent. So we're building our collection of ceramics. And we're building a collection of African-American art. As a matter of fact, the museum is actively working right now with the MLK Coalition to build the story beyond the Underground Railroad of the artists and the writers from Warren County's African-American community who have contributed, but whose work we have no copies of. So we're working to make that real and manifest as part of our collection. It's very important that we should do that. This is by a good friend of mine and our board member, Pat Allen, Bing Davis, Willis Bing Davis, who had a wonderful show here. And Bing, of course, sat in my office and he held two of the original gallery guides to the Harmon Foundation exhibits in the 20s in Harlem that William Elmer Harmon sponsored and funded. He turned the pages. He said, Michael, these were given to me by my aunt when I was a little boy in the Carolinas. This is what inspired me to go into art, that it was all right, that I could make a living in art. Bing is in his 80s, doing well, and uh, is just an incredible character. He we were given this as this called the Warriors Prayer Dance Mask. And this was a donation thanks to Sylvia. So we want to thank her for that. We have an awful lot of very generous people who help make this an enriched place. Found on the Internet, found on the Internet, a wonderful, free, fun work by Jean Vincent Chute, who for many, many years taught art at Lebanon High School. He was a graduate of Cranbrook Academy of Art and Design. And this one wound up around Columbus, Ohio. So we don't know how it wound up there. We have some conjectures, but nevertheless, we build a collection of Jean. Rosemary still comes in to work downstairs every Thursday, cleaning paintings. And you're going to see one this afternoon that she recently finished. but really quite nice. And I think it's a fun, fun piece. It's got a lot of life and energy in it. And this work, because oddly enough, again, from the descendant of Ichabod Corwin and Francis Dunleavy, we have this marvelous por portrait of Lord Arthur Cavendish in its original frame, and you'll notice underneath it says Francis Coates R.A. That means member of the Royal Academy. Now, curiously, when we before we hung the painting, I discovered two pieces of paper shoved between the frame and the stretcher of the artwork on the rear, on the verso. The first was a letter that certified that this had been owned by Princess Louise, the Princess Royal, the Duchess of Connaught, who was the eldest daughter of King Edward VII, that it had been sold in 1931 upon her death out of the royal collection, because it was in the royal collection. It was sold to a dealer in London, and the London dealer certified, one, that it came from Princess Louise and the royal collection, and two, of all things, that it was an original Francis Coates. Now you say, well, what's, why, why, what's the significance of Francis Coates? Francis Coates was one of nine men who came together to found the Royal Academy of Art in the 1760s. That is so significant. This painting is unbelievably important. It's one of the few that survive outside of England itself. 
and we should be very proud of this work. It's just about we're going to clean the frame and we're going to give it a light cleaning because it doesn't need a whole lot. And we're hoping to get a, a little bit better lighting up on the mezzanine. So I think that concludes the slide. So I brought a table of odds and ends over here that I thought you might be interested in because I just think it's fun. The first is a box on the back. And this is called Surreal Assemblage Number 16. And it is by a Cincinnati artist, and he is a freelance educator, but he also taught in Florida, and he taught at the University of Cincinnati. And this is by Elmer Ruff. And we now have two of Elmer's assemblages. He's now 84. And um, we had one that was purchased and donated, and one, of course, that he gifted to us that is in a series of works. But he loves to put all of these disparate pieces together. And if you look at this long enough, you'll find how it all begins to link together, which is a phenomenal thing. This little, very heavy, Elmer Ruff assemblage number 16. A book came our way, which is kind of curious. And Sylvia did a great deal of research on this because I went, oh, it's a moldery old book. What are we going to do with it? And it's typed and it has all sorts of copies and it has all sorts of drawings. And how did it find its way here? It came out of someone's attic. And they said, we're cleaning the attic out. We found it. What better place to take stuff from the attic than to the museum, right? Well, we're happy to take your stuff from the attic out there, if you're listening. But the fact of the matter is, this is a document written by an Ohio State University graduate by the name of Shirley Ray Craig. He died in... ...find, and a most significant find for the governments of the United States and of Canada because this is the original proof of his journey to and experiments on the finding of great uranium deposits around Great Bear Lake in Canada. And those were vitally important, especially during the Second World War. So here we have it. You see, we never know what comes in the door. That's why even on the worst days, when things don't seem to be going too right around here, we always get our spirits lifted when somebody comes in and says, here, I found this. What is it? <laughs> Wonderful. This is a piece that I think the Cincinnati Art Museum would really like, but we have it. <laughs> and it, on the top of it, it says, presented by Ben Pittman. Ben Pittman was born in England in 1822. In 1850, he came to the United States and began teaching at what then became, it was the McGuigan School of Art and Design, but became the Cincinnati Art Academy. He taught decorative arts and wood carving. This box that he carved with the owls on it and the leaves and the beautiful top and the lining on it was given to Eli Harvey of Harvey's Berg, our wonderful Quaker sculptor of animals, when Eli was an undergraduate at the same college. Ben Pittman's work is largely in the Cincinnati wing of the Cincinnati Art Museum, all that beautiful art carved furniture because Ben had a very interesting talent, but he also had a very keen eye for talent. And most of the work in that collection at the Cincinnati Art Museum, seen over by Ben Pittman, were carved by women. Whether it's mantles, or whether it's great sideboards, or tables, or bedsteads, a lot of the art carved furniture in the city of Cincinnati was created by dedicated Woman, women artists. It's just amazing. 
So we have this beautiful Ben Pittman box that I read about and read about and thought, where is it, where is it, where is it? I hunted it for two years. One day I opened the bottom desk drawer, moved a piece of paper, and there's Ben Pittman's box. <laughs> Sometimes something as simple as a metronome has a great story. I tell you about stories with folk art, but objects have a journey too. This was donated to us, and I thought, well, we don't have a metronome for the music shop. That would be kind of nice. But it was the story that I read on the accession document where everything is photographed and Raquel Kersher and Nancy Lewis describe these things in great detail and they go through and if they have the opportunity, they talk to the person who's donated it so we know some of the history. There was a fellow by the name of Arden Dean Wilson who was born and raised in Wheeling, West Virginia. He went to college and he was an architect, but during the Great Depression, there was no money to be made in architecture. No one was hiring an architect. So he fell back on what he thought was his hobby. And in 1938, he created the Arden Wilson Big Band, <laughs> just like Glenn Miller. And they played in Wheeling, West Virginia, and they played in Pittsburgh. They played in Detroit, and oh my heavens, they played at Moonlight Gardens in Coney Island in Cincinnati. Now, when the war broke out on December the 7th, 1941, all the men in that band joined the service, as most everyone did. As a matter of fact, Arden Wilson himself became the pilot of a B-17 that crashed, and he was never recovered, much like Glenn Miller. So we have his metronome in our collection with its incredible story. And that story will never be forgotten as we display this metronome proudly in our music room on the Village Green. When we open this parcel from Mr. Niehoff, I will tell you I never saw such joy, as they would say, in Mudville, as I saw from the textile department. This is called Stone, Stonehurst Houses by Lori Swim. It was created in 2005, and it's made of hand-dyed cottons, cotton gauze, organza, lace, rayon hairy yarn, dupioni silks, and it is the most amazing textile I have ever seen. That's not a paper. Isn't that phenomenal? It's just breathtakingly beautiful. It really is. And you could look at this thing, and it's just amazing to see how she put such a thing together. And this work and her work are featured in several national books on folk art. So when I talked to Mr. Niehoff and we were talking about folk art and Harmon and all of those things, you know, we were saying, well, folk art, for the most part, you have to go to Virginia, Kentucky. Well, here we are between Cincinnati and Dayton in this ever-growing corridor. And why not? If we have a folk art collection that becomes as strong as our textile collection, as strong as our Native American collection, as strong as that remarkable Shaker collection, the Jones Shaker, the show, Jones Shaker Gallery, wow, we add strength to the museum. We have more and more visitors, and it bodes well for our future as we diversify the collection and strengthen it. Now, oftentimes, when I talked to the new leader of the state of Ohio, Megan Wood, I find that all of the old animosity between the museum and Glendower and all that whole kind of play over the years has fallen away. 
I said to her, well, so many of the people that carry those grudges are gone. I'm not one to do that. And she said, likewise on our end up here at Columbia. So I was very pleased when we did some research and we were looking for a portrait that they had. A portrait of a fellow by the name of, uh, a portrait of a fellow by the name of James Lawrence McDonald. Now he doesn't seem any, you know, we did some research. James Lawrence McDonald had a really incredible story. So we called, and what do you know? They had this portrait, and thank heavens the information on the back side was not quite correct. And they said, oh sure, come and get it. We were gonna sell it. We were gonna decommission it because we're thinning out our storage areas. Sylvia and I and Jeannie made haste. <laughs> To Columbus and we found this portrait as well as some other things they gave us I don't think they realized the bonnets they gave us were shaker but they were and I was grateful for that but nevertheless the portrait was in very very meager shape you could see that it had been lined but done poorly there was paint loss you could see fiber of the under canvas it was incredibly fragile I did not think we could save it Sylvia was intrigued with the painting, and she said, I'm going to take it to Old World Restoration, and I'm going to donate the amount of money it costs to restore it. And that was an incredible amount of money, believe it or not. It was that far gone. Now let me tell you about James Lawrence McDonald. He was born in 1801, and he was Choctaw. He came to the attention, because of his intellect, to John C. Calhoun in Tennessee, the great statesman. Calhoun said, this fellow has an incredible gift. I think he should go into the law. Now imagine a Native American in that time period. So what does he do? He calls his, who well, doesn't call, he sends a letter <laughs> to his good friend, John McLean, who is then the Chief Justice, our John McLean, who's the Chief Justice of the Ohio Supreme Court. And he said, he could come to Lebanon and he could clerk for you. He would learn a lot. And so that's what happened. And to make a long story short, what essentially happened was, James Lawrence McDonald became the first Native American lawyer, the first admitted to the bar in the United States. In 1823, he was admitted to the bar. Now, curiously enough, we think this portrait dates from the time he was admitted to the bar. There's no indication of signature, but I would be willing to bet you it's just a handful of artists that we're looking at that did this painting, and it was probably done locally. Now, what happened to James Lawrence McDonald? He left Lebanon, and he went to Jackson, Mississippi, where his mother resided, and he was the first to enjoin legal action to stop and challenge Andrew Jackson's removal of the Native Americans from the East. He had the temerity to do that. Unfortunately, at the same time, he fell in love with a white woman, and that was forbidden. And so, sadly, when she spurned him and turned him down, he went, according to the story, on a drinking binge, and he threw himself into the Pearl River in Jackson, Mississippi, and drowned in 1831. Now let me show you the painting, now restored. James Lawrence MacDonald restored as though I never thought we would ever see it. It was in such deplorable condition. And so we believe this was painted in 1823 when he was admitted to the bar. And I think that uh, that assumption is pretty correct because it's a pretty formal portrait. Now amazingly, as Sylvia and I were talking on the phone the other night, we had a painting that was given along with that beautiful Francis Coat painting that we saw this last summer. 
Rosemary and I started cleaning it two weeks ago, and we were repairing the frame as well. And the farther we cleaned, and it was a light cleaning, the more fascinating the painting became for us. Because it, it, it looked, looked like, like it was a high quality painting. It wasn't well, signed, although we did find on the back it was marked that it was sold at the Plaza Art Galleries in New York in 1927. They went out of business in 1960, but their archive went to the Freer Gallery of Art. So I went to the Freer's website, I went through their entire series of uh, uh, catalogs, and I found out that the Plaza Art Galleries in the 20s were selling an entire estates of English country houses. This was before the crash. But they would literally go to England and buy everything on the walls and the furniture and so forth and so on and bring it to New York and auction it off. That was one curious thing. We also found that on the stretchers, it had a Brooklyn gallery, which meant the painting had been relined, and Plaza Art frequently relined paintings. Then we found in the lower left hand corner a date, 1823. Then, a week later, after it had been cleaned and before we varnished it, I happened to stumble upon two friends who were experts in the work of a particular painter who I had an eye on as possible, the fellow who did this. One of the reasons I did it was the brushstroke and the style, the pose, the various little things going on in the painting. The other thing, was the fact that he never signed any of his paintings. And he admitted that, it's in his diaries. And it's quite known, he never signed his paintings. He's a bridge between Thomas Gainsborough and a later American expatriate by the name of John Singer Sargent. He's the man in the middle painting for King George III and King George IV. She has no name, but we prepare and present to you a painting by Sir Thomas Lawrence, the painter to King George III and King George IV. So when I begin to view our collection and how we're growing and expanding in so many ways, I keep reminding myself Schools in Warren County, you do not need to load your students onto buses and ship them to the Cincinnati Art Museum. We'll give them a good run for their money right here. Bring them here. You can see first-rate European art. You can see nine of the first 13 painters in Northwest Territories. You can see incredible Native American collections, the most beautiful folk art. You go into that gallery and it just lifts your spirit. It's an amazing experience, immersive, here at this museum. As director, you know, we fight the good fight every day. We thank you for attending Lunch and Learns. We thank each and every one of you for uh, participating in our programs whether it's music at the museum or whether it's the openings of the Beetle House or the, the openings of the art shows that we advertise. We don't do those things because we don't have other things to do. We do those things because that's where our source of funding is. Many people assume that the museum, because it says Warren County, is funded largely by the county. It isn't. It's a small part of our budget. We're given some utility credits by the city of Lebanon. I had a couple in here last week and they said, my golly, why aren't you free for everybody on Saturdays like the Cincinnati Art Museum? Well, my friends, we have no banking institution in Warren County that's ever even offered to help us. We have no realty company or no corporation that writes us a check every year to help us with anything. We have to earn every dollar that we spent. And we want to make sure that you and our membership knows that we do this wisely. And we're very, very careful and very grateful. We are the stewards of these incredible donations. And the collection is ever growing, and that's a new and healthy dynamic. And when I see on a Saturday young families bringing their kids in, 
that's also a wonderful and good dynamic because that's the future of the Warren County Historical Society and Harmon Museum. You know, one thing I want to do in closing is I'm an aficionado of Winston Churchill and his many quotes. Some I won't repeat here, obviously. But one of my favorites is he said to a historian, traveling with a companion called change is often uncomfortable. But he said it is change that creates the new history. And like it or not, we must embrace it and walk with it. So as we move forward here, we have a lot of incredible opportunities, new opportunities, and a forward-thinking board and membership that I think will carry us well into the future. I thank you for this brief amount of time. I encourage you, there are a lot of things that I couldn't pick up and bring down here, and a lot of things that I couldn't drag Nathan up to take photos of, or Jeannie up to take photos of, but we've just begun a new journey. Thank you very much. Uh, right. I wanted to let you know, do you, any of you have any questions about anything? So. How would it have been worth, worth seeing it repaired? So the portrait of the gentleman. Um, How did it look in the beginning? Oh, well, it was, it was, it was so thin yeah. here, you can see the fibers of the canvas. Mm -hmm. There was paint mm -hmm. loss there. There was discoloration, there was a wrinkle, there was a hole. Mm -hmm. uh, it looked like it was barely, the pigment was barely hanging on to the, the canvas itself. And the frame, you could do this with it, and the, the miters were very loose. Um, I really appreciate Sylvia taking that under her wing because it's such a significant addition to our collection. And the story that goes with it is even more remarkable. Mm -hmm. uh, to have an image of the first Native American who was admitted to the American Bar Association and who had the courage to go up against the great removal uh, <laughs> phenomenon. Uh, I'm sorry he met such a tragic end, but we were very happy to get him back. And I was very happy that the Ohio History Connection was so cooperative in getting those things back to us. So, yes. The depth and breadth of your knowledge blows my mind. Oh. <laughs> you, when I go through the museum, I see things, but they don't mean much to me. Um, do you do tours? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I do tours. I do tours. I met one not long ago, and someone asked me if uh, there was a DVD available of a museum tour for sale. Yeah, as a matter of fact, uh, Sinclair Community College's art classes went through here not long ago, and they asked if we had a DVD because they would like to play that when they can't get here because some of their students obviously commute. Uh, it's not like a residential campus like Miami, uh, but they would wanted to know if we had this, and I said, well, unfortunately we don't. Again, it's a thing of finances. We we would love to do it, but uh, you know, it's it's. It's so frustrating when the staff and I see what we've got here, and then people come in the door and say, well, I've lived here for 38 years, and I didn't know you're here. <laughs> well, we don't have the money to do a direct mailer. Uh, we need that additional support. And it frustrates me when corporations and institutions in this county are giving money to arts and culture organizations in Hamilton and in Hamilton County, and they're not giving anything to us. And I, I don't know what we can do. So we're going to try. Mr. Nehoff and I were talking, and we're going to start twisting the cat's tail. <laughs> so, and my knowledge, well, I, don't, I can't explain it, Christine. I don't, I'm just, 
when I see a piece and I know the story, it's like it's there. Mm -hmm. And it, to me, it makes these things live. Mm -hmm. And I don't look at them as, oh, that old piece of this or that. You know, to me, it's like, and the staff, thank heavens, both the paid staff and importantly, the volunteer staff, take our jobs as the stewards of this connect collection. And we're only here for a brief time. We're gonna pass it forward, but we want it organized. We want people to understand the value of what's here and how important it is to our heritage. So, anybody else? No? Okay, well, I didn't mean to suck the oxygen out of the room. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah.